everyone, and uh, thanks again for coming tonight. For those who've been before, thank you for coming back. And for those who haven't been before, um, welcome. And I'm sure we'll answer lots of your questions throughout the night, and at the end we'll, we'll have room for tours. Thank you to Nigel for being with us this evening. Uh, my name's Sarah Leo. For those who don't know me, I'm the General Manager of Brand Strategy and People here at Open Book Howden. And uh, I'll be asking Nigel some questions tonight to to go through the process of editing and uncover a few things. For those who've been before, we're going to change the format ever so slightly where we will uh, open up for questions during the session. So if Nigel says something and you have a, a question pertaining to the, that particular moment, please just pop your hand up because we'll have a microphone, even if you can speak loudly, which I can't, um, we'll, we'd like to capture the question on, on audio because it's being filmed this evening and we'll, um, we'll pose the question to Nigel. Great, lovely. So Nigel's bio, I'm going to read just to make sure I don't get it wrong. Nigel Stark is a journalist and a scholar. He's a former Southeast Asia correspondent for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and has written and produced and appeared in documentaries for the ABC and the South Australian Film Corporation. He wrote his PhD thesis on the obituary and newspaper practice and teaches obituary composition in his courses at the University of South Australia, where he is a senior lecturer in creative writing. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sarah. Just to, to follow yeah. on from your bio, could you uh, explain to us how you, how you transitioned from that amazing career into editing and... Certainly, and I think it's just a love of words. I've always loved words. When the tech guys were fixing me up with this wonderful sound system tonight, one of them, and I think it was, uh, it was Will, said, we're going to make you look like Britney Spears. <laughs> I can see now. Yeah, I can yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> what you probably don't know is that an anagram of Britney Spears is Presbyterians. <laughs> I love words. I adore <laughs> them. They fascinate me. They say so much. That's where it came from. I just got to be involved with words wherever I go. Thank you. Excellent. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Nor was I. <laughs> Britney Spears didn't come up in conversation before. Did I? <laughs> so uh, we've been working with Nigel recently on uh, a, a book for Scott Bucock, mm. who, for those of you who watch TV, he was on Shark Tank, and he's the inventor of uh, Heg's Pegs, the orange pegs that they sell in Foodland. So uh, Scott has been writing his, his autobiography, and we approached Nigel to help edit that book, and which is going to be pretty amazing. And throughout the evening, Nigel will talk about um, or make reference to that process and some of the anecdotes from that book. So cool. um, should that book be of interest to you, we, we can register your details for when the book release comes out, and, um, and we'll cover that throughout the evening. OK, so we talked about how you became an editor. Something to do with Britney Spears. <laughs> That's I what should you said, give a, it? a more full answer. Uh, I did a long time ago a cadetship on newspapers, which is perhaps the best training of all. And I used to sit with the proofreader who was a retired editor and try to pick up mistakes. Of course, I made mistakes myself. And the worst one I ever did was miss a zero out of a house price on a real estate. <laughs> And so now you check obsessively for everything. I mean, absolutely everything. Little story just about uh, this Scott Bucock book, which was a terrific book to work on. The man is so enthusiastic, incredible person. And I don't say this in any way as a criticism of him. He'd referred to a particular street. And I wasn't sure about the spelling, and I checked it online, and the street was MacArthur Drive. Now, any name in the English language with the Scottish Mac in it, M-A-C or M-C or M and then little c and big C, you've always got to check them and find which is the right one. You obsessively check everything. And that comes from having worked on a newspaper and having made mistakes. We learn by our mistakes. Our lives are works in progress. You've just got to make it a pleasant sort of progress by learning what's wrong and how people are offended, upset, thrown by mistakes. And there's the old saying that um, surgeons 
bury their mistakes. Lawyers jail their mistakes. Editors publish their mistakes. <laughs> and it's a horrible feeling when you get the paper and you see you've done something wrong. You've made a mistake and it's in print. It's just awful. You have published your human frailty. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that because you referred when we were talking about um, those published mistakes and then how people can use those in research materials oh, yes. later as well. Look, this is the thing you see. If you make a mistake in print, you as the proofreader or the editor will feel a bit bad about it. But there'll probably be a second impression and you can put things right. But mistakes are replicated. Classic little example. Um, here's my latest book on sale tonight for the special price of $20. And afterwards. But, and, uh, and signed. <laughs> and signed. signed. <laughs> but uh, it does refer to the... I, I wrote about the eminent British author Anthony Trollope and his journeys to Australia. By the way, the people standing at the back, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six seats in business class up here. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to come forward. And one here, so uh, please come forward. So... And one seat there, yep. They're, they're all staff. We, all right. we okay. don't let them sit down. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So I wrote this book about the eminent Victorian author, Anthony Trollope, who wrote 47 novels, an incredible man. He came to Australia twice by sea. Now, in the official Cambridge companion to Anthony Trollope, one of the great classic reference works in British literary history, it said that each time this famous author came to Australia in the 1870s, he came via the Suez Canal. He didn't. I found that out through researching for this book. I looked up the ship's log, and to catch the trade winds, they came around the Cape each time. But that mistake is in the Cambridge Guide, so people keep on quoting it, but it's wrong. So, yes, mistakes are made, and unfortunately, they're replicated. So it takes an assiduous, an incisive editor to try to minimise our mistakes and Try to add something to the body of knowledge, but in so doing, make it accurate. So you, you had a passion for editing. If someone in the audience tonight wanted to become an editor, ah. what would the process be? Oh, there's, um, there's several, isn't there? There's... I think you've, you, you've, you've got to have a love of language, and I'm sure you all have, and I'm terribly grateful to be here mixing with you tonight. You've got to have that love of words, that love of language. You've got to have read a lot. To find out what is good and what is not so good, what's well edited and what's not so well edited. Always be willing to state an opinion. Have your own writing examined by an editor or a, a colleague, a friend whose opinion you respect, and take that criticism. One of the greatest authors of all time, William Somerset Maugham, wonderful author, master of the short story, would always have his work read by a particular American professor whose opinion he respected, and he would always follow it, which was a great example, I think, of humility in a top rank, absolutely wonderfully gifted author to respect another opinion. So you learn the process by having your own work examined, by, if you can, having your own work published, and by seeing how editors work with you. Now, I've had editors working with, we, with me and I've found them tremendous people. I've taken their advice to heart. They often don't get paid a lot for their work, but what they do is incredibly valuable. It, it is a critical process. Now, we can go a bit later into the, the two realms, if you like, of proofreading and editing, but essentially they're intertwined. Great. That was a good segue because that was my next question. So there is, there's a difference between proofreading and editing. Can you explain? Proofreading on that is more technical. You're looking at the manuscript. I mean, I've done proofreading of legal documents and that sort of stuff. So you're looking at the original, then looking at the type and saying, is it the same? That little example of the name of a drive, Mark MacArthur Drive, that's more proofing than editing. The greater body, though, of what I call thematic editing. It's looking at the language and the way the book is composed. Now, Scotty, this is a great example. This was a, a really, a, a tremendously exciting project to work on. Here's this man, extremely successful, bursting with life and ideas, absolute human dynamo of a man, incredible person. I met him here uh, towards the end of last year and agreed to take on this project. I said, mate, I can't start this. I can't do it until December. Fine, fine, fine. I said, Reckon about, we need a book about 25,000 words. He turned up with 55,000. <laughs> so then you're not just proofing, you are changing his story. 
You're getting into his narrative. You're cutting it back in places. You're looking at the order because as a, uh, an inexperienced writer, he tended to tell the story chronologically, but we needed to have moments in the text where we'd have, I was born here, but then this happened to me 30 years later, and that's all because of these experiences I had traveling here. So you get away from the chronological pattern. You produce drama and different chapters and segues and right through from one chapter to the next so the reader wants to read on. That is the job of the thematic editor, to take the book in its raw form and make it a polished eminently readable, exciting product. Great, because there's, a, a, is, that, um, is that a different type of editing? That's a structural I call that more well, thematic, structural, changing the voice, if mm -hmm. you like. The great thing about Scotty's book is his voice. It, it just, he writes as he speaks, and it comes out. It's very natural, in fact. Now, I had to just fix some of the expressions a bit, but it, it is a natural, unforced form of storytelling. He is a natural storyteller, and it just works because of that. That was the great strength of this man's book. Mm. And, you, and so that's, uh, to sum it up, it's sort of, uh, rather than going from point A to point B, it's, it's mixing and maybe starting at Z. It was to create drama and to make the reader think, I've got to go on with this. It's not just someone's life story. He is someone who has come from a really humble background. His parents are British migrants. He grew up in Alice Springs. He was quite untrained left school at about 16, just had various adventures. Then he started to become an innovator, an entrepreneur, and an inventor. And so you go from these early days and you say, well, that was my time in uh, Alice Springs. Uh, the reason I was able to, uh, uh, to achieve success later in life was because of a lot of those experiences I had out in the Red Centre. One of them was this, and you'd go into a, a dirt bike race he was in and that sort of stuff. And then you leap ahead, and there he is shaking hands with political leaders and media identities and getting his big prize. And then you go back and find out how he got that far. You bring drama and shape into it and a bit of the old sort of cliffhanger going from one chapter to the next to make the reader want to read on. Yes, great. That could be frightening a few people who own their, who own, own who the are writing and own the book. <laughs> so it, it could, I mean, you may not want your editor to do that. But if you have an editor, I think you are duty-bound to listen to them. I'll tell you one little example I had on a book I wrote a few years ago, which was, um, it actually was, it came out of my research on the art of the obituary, which is a beautiful form of journalism. And that book of mine was published by Melbourne University Press. 5,000 print run, we sold out in the end, didn't do too badly. Uh, but my editor picked up a point. I'd referred to, I, I each, I had a preamble to each chapter. I positioned myself in the text, the author doing this, the author doing that. And I was in the British Library in London, and I referred to the library assistant who was helping me as big, black, and bespectacled. Alliteration. My editor said, why are you saying black? I said, what's wrong with saying black? He was. Nothing wrong with that, and it's nice. She said, but if he was white, would you have said that? I said, no, I wouldn't. So we changed it. And we did it by suggestion. She said, I think it's slightly offensive. And I think she was right. So I said that he spoke to me, even though he came from Bermondsey in the language of the West Indies. I, I, I worked out a line in there where I was able to talk about his accent and suggest who he was more subtly mm. that way. So um, you listen to your editor. You respect what they say. You don't have to do it. But normally your editor is a highly experienced person and it's unwise to reject their advice. Yes. And sometimes we can become a bit attached to our own work. Oh, you're passionate. You, you're not, you, people, I mean, it's like someone who, who, who writes a play and said, of course, there's only one thing to play the lead, that's me. You know, it, it's ridiculous. People actually say that and they're wrong. You, you've got to take the advice of publishers, editors, casting directors, the works, because you can't do it. All yourself, unless you're Orson Welles. <laughs> w e w l e s. You, you, in talking as well, you, I didn't realise that editors um, went to this extent. You were talking about the um, inclusion of illustrations mm. and photography to tell the story and to bring this, those in. Again, is a critical point. Um, I, I've only written four books myself. I've edited a lot of work, though, not only books, but but magazine articles and magazines and newspapers forever. 
illustrations are critical. They complement the text. They're really vital. And you have to think hard where they're coming from, whether you've got copyright permission to use them, how much they're going to cost, all that sort of stuff, because the author is often up for that cost. It's a significant thing. Again, that book I did about the obituary art, I wanted very much to publish a beautiful portrait of Queen Charlotte, consort of George III. And I found a superb portrait, National Portrait Gallery in London. They wanted 300 pounds for it, which really was a lot of money. You know? And I was able to find a little line drawing that cost me about $50, so I went with that instead. It, you've got to do your research. Use agencies if necessary. Getty Images, people like that. Uh, seek clearance to use. But everything. I, I wanted to quote in another book just a few lines, just a f four lines in a poem by T.S. Eliot. A little story about T.S. Eliot. Evelyn War, whose work I admire enormously, was fascinated by the fact that T.S. Eliot backwards is almost toilets, but not quite. Um, <laughs> but I had four lines from this poem by T.S. Eliot. And I thought, I better just check it's available. The copyright was held by his widow, who was in her 90s. There was about 40 year age difference. And she held it most jealously. It meant a lot to her. I had to pay a, a small amount to use those lines. It took a lot of negotiation, letters, but she did do it. She released it and that was fine. You've got to check everything. You do not want to have a legal problem and a good editor would advise you on what you can say and what you can't say, not only in defamation and all that sort of stuff, but in copyright and availability and usage of material. Mm. And I was... Uh, uh, sorry, we have a question. Yes. Hello, sir. It's actually... It's on the uh, point you've just raised of uh, using other people's yeah. work. So if you decide to... You, you want to use a sentence... And you, sure. you acknowledge who they are. Yep. Is that still... Yes, there's a thing, fair, fair dealing, OK? And there are limits to that. Normally you can use up to 10% of a work and all that sort of stuff. Newspapers, magazines are on the public record. That's fine. But it is courtesy to acknowledge it properly and not just to say, not to present it as your own work or to present it anon anonymously. But there are copyright laws you can follow. Your publisher will advise you on those. It's a good idea, by the way, the Copyright Council of Australia has regular workshops. It's quite a good idea to go to one sometime. You'll get the answers from that. Good question. Thank you. I don't remember what my question was now. Um, oh, it was something to do with... Oh, oh, that's what it was. It was to say that I, in speaking with you again and talking about the, the use of illustration and photography and the structure of the book, I was, um, I was gathering that it would be great for the, for the editor who's involved in the context and the vision to speak directly to the designers. Oh, I love working with designers. It's, it's the most wonderful experience. And I actually had a bust up with the publisher because the publisher wouldn't let me do it. I just wasn't going to work with that publisher again and didn't complete my book with that publisher. It's critical. You've got to have a part in and work with the designer on the font, on how you're going to present captions, how you're going to design the cover, where you're going to have your glossies, all this sort of stuff, whether you're going to scatter the illustrations of the book or have a, a special little section. It's of critical importance, and I just love it. I, I, at the moment, uh, one of the regular jobs I have is editing a quarterly magazine, and it's a great pleasure working with the designer on that. I mean, I know what I want, but I can't actually do it myself. But you've got to have an eye for that sort of thing. And it's a, a beautiful realisation to look at the visual and not just the narrative side of the product, because it is of critical importance. Cover design, the works, the blurb, Everything. It's a really good idea to work very closely with a designer. And you'll, you'll find, I find them just admirable. I think they're terrific people and I respect them enormously. So there's, there's a, a whole array of, of qualified editors mm. and we'll talk about how to find those in a mm. minute. Could your friend edit your work for you? Good question. Great question. Yes, I think so, depending upon how experienced they are and how long you want the friendship to last. <laughs> <laughs> I find, would you go to a very close friend in the medical profession for something invasive? I don't know. 
Sometimes going to someone you really don't know is better because it's a surgical procedure. And I, I think it's all right if they're really good at it. Generally speaking, I find it's good to go to someone you really don't know, but who's highly recommended. Great question. Mm. So, Sorry, just microphone, one sir. second. Yes, David, yes. Almost a follow on from that, I'm putting together an anthology of poetry. Yep. And it's, we found it, just, I'm working with another editor as well, and we found it's really important that the poet's name only goes on the back so that we don't look at it unless we really want to look at it, so that we're reading it not knowing whose it is. Oh, I think uh, the question there on poetry and the identity of the author, it's like, um, I'm trying to think of another example of it. Uh, in the academic field, um, if you are, you are sent a, an assignment that wasn't perhaps one in which you were involved, it's a good idea to have it anonymous so there's no danger of a personal opinion colouring it. I think it's a great point. Yeah, it, it can, can't it? Definitely. It's, it's a very good idea to try to keep that degree of anonymity. Obviously, a, an author uh, working with a single editor, they're going to know who they are. But with an anthology, it's a good idea. I had a, a very bad experience editing an anthology once. Um, in fact, this was where why we handed out this little style sheet a bit earlier, and questions of style and design are really, matter, uh, really vital. It's just a little... It's a, I'm saying, not saying this is the recommended style guide, but it's an example of one. Has everybody got one of those? Uh, but, but, well, everything has a deliberate mistake, so clever people think. Um, uh, 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 now, we, we had the little sheet like this and uh, handed it out, and uh, the, I had 16 contributors, 16 contributors from around the country, and all of them highly qualified academics. I reckon about five of them followed the style. I mean, some of them ignored it completely and put in a thing called in-text referencing and all this sort of stuff, just didn't even read it, obviously, ignored it completely. And it was really one of the most disappointing jobs I'd done. I didn't enjoy... I did not enjoy editing their work because they had ignored our professional request to follow a certain style. So... Uh, Adhering to a recommended style is important. Uh, I did a job some years ago. I, I didn't, anyone ever here done work for the American press or American books at all? One of the hardest I had was editing uh, a series of journal articles for the United States. Different expressions. Verbs are differently presented. Spellings are different. Uh, it's, it really is the most awkward thing. Of these, if you've dealt for decades with doing things a certain way, then you change it. It's a great challenge. I found, that, I found that really difficult and would be reluctant to take on a job like that again. Mm. Is there any more questions on that line, please? We'll just yes. grab the Julia? microphone. Yes. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's just my uh, ignorance. I didn't understand indicative spellings to note. S and Z. Uh, yeah, it's, about, it's about S and Z in uh, uh, verb endings. Acknowledgement, judgment. Oh yeah, sure. Program. What they're saying is that their preference there, and I just I just lifted that from a, a Melbourne publisher. Their preference was judgment without an e in the middle, uh, uh, recognised with an S rather than a Z, uh, that sort of thing. Let's first find what you, you found later. But um, uh, it's uh, indicative. They're saying here these. This shows you the sort of spellings we want in this series of, of words. Good question, thank you. Um, AGPS, the Australian Government Publishing Service Style Guide, is an extraordinary book. Massive, uh, huge work, but it does give you the answer to just about everything you want. The only area of it with which I dramatically disagree is on the possessive apostrophe. By the way, I love obituaries. If anyone here is ever going to write my obituary, just say one thing of me, that he had a passionate concern for the correct placement of the possessive apostrophe. That's fine. I, I don't want anything else. That's right. But the, the AGPS is a bit slack with its possessive apostrophes, I believe, and it should be a lot stricter. There's a few people empathising, I think. I, OK. I mean, I, I'll show you an example of this. Um, they will say, for example, poor old Rolf Harris in a bit of strife at the moment. OK. They'll say to Rolf, 
You see this in the paper, and the Australian government style guide actually allows this, okay? Ralph Harris imprisonment, nobody like that. Wrong, it's Harris's. It should be there, right? It, it's just bad, <laughs> inaccurate, disgraceful. <laughs> should be burnt. <laughs> Do I make it clear? Thank you. <laughs> Aiden. Are we burning our teachers? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were taught that, but you, you're, teachers are wonderful people. <laughs> I adore teachers. But they often tell you, it ends with an S, dear, put the apostrophe afterwards. <laughs> Wrong! Thank you. <laughs> that was another one taught that as well. Yeah, I know. Uh, in the 90s, it was Judith. Really? <laughs> I'm a Flinders graduate and I'm appalled. Okay. <laughs> Hayden, you come to me. I'll help you with your apostrophes. All right? We could use you in the office, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm agreeing with these gent I'm agreeing with these gentlemen. Yeah. We were told that if it ends in an S, yes. it wasn't necessary to put Yeah, I know. And the AGPS says that. It's but wrong. That, mm, because but, we we right. say, we say Ralph Harris is, you know, is anyone, any, David Harris, here we are, his brother-in-law. Um, it says uh, <laughs> David Harris's black shirt, not David Harris's black shirt. It's ludicrous. Hello, doctor. What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> this is editor on editor well, now. Here, here we go. Come, here it comes. <laughs> Everyone step right aside. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're not just a surfy chick, are you? Come on, hit me where it hurts. <laughs> what about Jesus? Jesus? Oh, yes, I can answer that one because the Oxford Guide to English Usage says the names of liturgical significance. And Jesus is slightly liturgically significant, isn't he? are allowed to have it after the S. I don't bloody well know why, but they say it. So I go along with it. All right. That was a good one, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, Elvis to me... <laughs> Actually, I saw him just out the back street. <laughs> He's working at the BP around the corner. <laughs> Elvis's hips, all right? You would say Elvis's, I would argue. All right. Though to some people, Elvis and Jesus are synonymous. <laughs> <laughs> these are good questions. Keep them rotten rolling. They're lovely. I'm just throwing these questions out. Yeah, now. yeah, throw them. <laughs> Proofreading. Oh, yeah. You mentioned the other day that you, after editing, you still prefer to use a separate person yeah. to proofread. Good question on that book. I've worked on this book. God knows I've sweated on this book. I know it too intimately, actually, to proofread it. Um, we need someone like you to prove. We, we need an incisive mind and eyes from someone who is not familiar with the text to proofread it. It is, I've said they're intertwined, but there are times when there's a little divorce and I've got to divorce myself from this text. There are things I could very possibly gloss over. And as I said before, I hate making mistakes. So, I mean, I'll show you just about the worst mistake I made in, in writing. Years ago, I was working for the Canberra Times and I wrote a little story, the early, early 1970s, wrote a story about a young guy who had uh, won, in those days, Lake Burley, Lake Burley Griffin wasn't so polluted and you could like, swim in it. And this bloke had won a long distance swimming race in Lake Burley Griffin. I interviewed him for the Canberra Times and one of the questions I said, that I asked him, was, Who is your coach? And he said, my coach is Stan O'Neill. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're writing Stan O'Neill, Stan O'Neill, how would you spell the surname? O? Apostrophe, yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. N? Like that. Any variation on that? Two L's. Might be a second L, I agree with you. Anything else? A N. As in Ryan O'Neill, okay? Idiot here. Did that. I was I done like a dead ship. Supposed to be a trained journalist, all that sort of stuff. I wrote that. It was on the front page of the paper the next day, and the parents rang up the next morning, wanted to photograph. So I said, "You find like the story?" Oh, it was all right. I said, "Oh, sorry. What was wrong?" They said, "Oh, I got the coach's name wrong. The coach, ladies and gentlemen, the coach. 
of this young champion swimmer was Stan uh, Neil. Burma railway survivor, World War II hero, former Australian 400 metres champion, and I got it wrong because I didn't ask how to spell it. Stupid. I've never forgotten that. You feel so small. It's a bad thing to do. Smith, a friend of mine, Michael Smith, formerly at the ABC, uh, Drive Time Show, former Channel 9, newsreader, Michael Smith, S-M-Y-T-H. Yeah. Phil Smythe, basketballer, same smelling, pronounced it Smythe, you know. you just got to check all the time, all the time. And it is so embarrassing when you get it wrong, and it's your fault. It's a horror, your guts just go to you. It's a dreadful feeling. Very embarrassing. So advocating for a separate proofreader. A separate proofreader. Proof someone who is not so close to the action. Really vital. It helps a clinical mind who is not going to change the thematic book, not going to change the shape and the voice, but it's just going to look at the nuts and bolts and the technique of it. Critical. So there's people in this room who might be writing a children's book, uh, poetry, yeah. they might be writing a family history, a community yeah. history. How do they find the right editor for them? Well, there is online a society of editors, and you're welcome. I would advise you in that case to look down the list and ring up and find, talk to them, see how they sound. Or if you're working with a publisher to get a recommendation, a personal recommendation is absolutely of critical importance. My last book, which in many ways I enjoyed the most, this one which is available for tonight, $20 signed by the author. Um, the <laughs> last one, that one was going to be published by a major Melbourne publisher. We had, unfortunately, a, a, a dispute that was really not my fault, though I had to drop them and had to self-publish in a real hurry. I learned a hell of a lot. And I just rang up a friend and said, how did you do it? And he told me, and I went to a typesetter and got it done. And it was a great experience. Um, and actually got a British publisher in the end to publish it. But ring, I mean, publishing industry knows everybody, and it's, uh, it's good to get a personal recommendation. That's what I do every time. Someone who has a speciality in that area, I was talking to a gentleman from the back of the room tonight who was writing a, a, a book on a theological theme, and I just said that probably most editors could do it, but if you were to ring up one or two or take the recommendation of the publisher who has a speciality, a feel for language of this type, then go with that. I think we all know our weaknesses. In fact, when we were having that discussion earlier, I said that I probably would be the last person you'd want to do, uh, use editing if it was a highly scientific work or one on engineering, because I just don't have that sort of mind. But richness of literature and language and history and that sort of stuff is more my field. So get a recommendation, ring a couple of people, see how you feel about them, because it's an intensely personal thing. This is the midwife for your book. You know? And so make it right. Make it the right mix. Very good. Right. Yeah. Good. Question there, sir? What's a good budget for that exercise? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the length of the book. It really does. It really, really does. And I've got to be a bit cautious about money tonight because uh, uh, there's a lot of um, professional reluctance to broadcast fees too widely. It's really a personal relationship, sometimes a bit of trading, a bit of negotiating in it. So uh, I don't know. I, well, I do know, but I, I'd actually rather not say because I don't know how long your book is. And I think we need to see a little idea of the text before actually giving a, a reasonable quote. Sorry, I'm dodging that one, but I think I have to. Yeah, uh, look, I, I always take a bit of a, a, a punt. I, I, I prefer to say I think this is worth that much money, OK, uh, rather than saying it'll give me these hours and I'll log up the hours, come up with a figure and see if it fits or not. So when you're approaching an editor, you um, expect to be asked for a sum. Oh, yes. Yeah. Look, it, 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 there's a feeling sometimes that publishing is a wonderfully sort of relaxed business with lots of chaps with sort of leather patches their elbows sitting in the club for lunch. <laughs> it's really quite hard. Rigorous business comes down to money. And if you want to publish a book, I mean, I've had this battle with publishers where they say, who's going to buy it? Who's going to buy it? That's the critical thing. You've got to have an answer. You've got to know. You've got to know also how you market it. 
this latest book of mine. I marketed in Australia, Europe and Britain and the States by going to literary societies, spruiking there, selling it myself, selling it through their membership, talking to Rotary Clubs, talking to Probus. I'm already on the line to a couple of historical societies in the state going on a trip this year. I push it myself wherever I can. You've got to have a marketing idea. You've got to know what your audience is because it's not just a piece of self-gratification. There should be a commercial angle to it most of the time. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a respectable thing to do. Any other questions at the moment? Great questions. Hello. Scotty, yeah. Mm. 55, yeah. I said, oh, mate, I said, look, um, thanks for that. It's wonderful. Got to keep you busy because we said 25,000, didn't we? He said, yes, no, we did. So he was fine. He's, he's very approachable, very direct. And he said, I just got a bit excited. That was all right. I said, well, uh, oh, okay, because uh, actually uh, Greg and I had a bit, a bit of a talk and we said this is the sort of book that's going to go very well uh, as a gift for Father's Day and that sort of stuff. Not too big a read. Uh, not too challenging in its language, nice and folksy and Aussie sort of feel about it, not too long, plenty of pics. If you go much longer than 25, the reader's are going to get bored and keep it under a certain price. Keep it down below that price, bigger the book, more expensive it is. So we had a, a price, as we saw, ceiling and a market ceiling and a voice ceiling, if you like. I'm not mixing the metaphor too much there. And uh, it, it, it just worked at that level. And Scott was very good about it. And I said, mate, all the stuff we're dumping, we can use for your next book, can't we? You know, you do it that sort of way. We were fine. He was going to be here tonight, by the way, but he's off in Canada and selling his things. So. Um, bit of a sort of weird question to approach, but um, do you feel that you need to uh, have a marketing plan in mind before you start writing the book? Ah, that's a great idea. I, I'd have to say I haven't because... Each of my books has been a Damascus Road experience. I've been walking along and suddenly, oh, yes, that's what I'm going to write about, you know? Um, then you think about the commercial side later. That's in my case. But there are many writers... Don't copy Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> there are many writers. Anthony Trollope, 47, 47 books. He had a commercial plan for every single one. And, he, and you can be driven by that. It's, it's not a bad idea to say, this is just going to be a little book for distribution to the conoscenti, that sort of stuff. Or I want to make some money out of it and I'm going to sell it through this organ and that organ and get it reviewed. It's great having a book reviewed. Great feeling, really good. So I would say it's a critical part of it. It doesn't always work like that. And in my case, it just didn't because I simply, the, the ideas came to me. But because I've worked in newspapers and commercial television, that sort of stuff. I've understood the commercial importance of things as well. And what I'm saying is essentially don't ignore it. It'll come into the process at some stage, bound to. And it depends on the, your book as well. So if it's a family history sure. or... And with publishing these days, you can do short runs. And so it may not be uh, a driver for you. But if you are going to try and sell it through a bookshop or um, to, the, to the general population who doesn't know you... You would, I would recommend you develop a marketing plan. Yep. I, I went to a Melbourne publisher recently. They had a, an incredibly beautiful book for cricket, cricket, cricket tragics, cricket fanatics, and it was selling for about four hundred dollars. But the publisher said, we will sell this. Mm. There are a few hundred people to whom we will write personally saying, you've got to have this. So there are marketing plans and there are marketing plans. All right? mm. Just to expand, uh, we've touched on the number of words that Scott gave you. Yeah. And uh, um, we, we've sort of skirted around the question, being that editors probably would prefer you not to write the entire book before you approach an editor. And so at what point in the project should you start those discussions? Well, I, I think it's a very good idea to have a look at least, say, six chapters. Now, Scotty's book, I think, was 16 chapters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I... I would have been happier. It would have been a great experience. But if I'd seen half a dozen chapters, we could have cut down my workload and a lot of his writing tremendously. So a good taster first is a very good feeling of it. A bit like going for a test drive in the car. Right? You get a good feeling of it that way. Uh, half a dozen chapters or so, really useful, really helps. You get a good feel of the narrative and the voice that, that helps tremendously. Mm. 
And on the point, the question before about uh, how Nigel capped that particular book at 25,000 words, that's really Nigel's, because Nigel has that experience in, in editing and in marketing and understanding the market. So he, he first thought about the market for the book, just to go back to your question, knowing that predominantly it's probably a male market yep. that, and Father's Day you, you mentioned, and then worked back on the number of words that realistically is going to, and the number of pages that that is going to fit the person who would buy that and, book. and children might want to buy it for dad, so it doesn't want to be too expensive. Mm. The cost is a critical factor. Lots of reasons to have an editor. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, and then the, the doctor. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, Nigel. It's following on, on the same point. Yeah. Imagine with all the books that come past, there are times, there's the book and you start to read it, and you think, oh, gee, I wish I hadn't taken this on. And um, it could be a matter of thinking, oh, gee, he's got a great story here, mm. but he's taken the whole approach. How do you handle that type Absolutely. of situation? Well, this has never no. happened to me. It would be very difficult. You tell, you, what you're saying is if you're given a manuscript to edit and it's just so bad it really needs completely redoing, is what you're saying? I'm saying, I'm saying that, but also you might see... Gee, there's a, there is a story here. And it's a bit oh, like it's what you said here. Come out. Yeah. yeah, instead of being in chronological order, yeah. this is what it is, and you really got to leave all this out. Sure. Look, I, I, I would certainly say it. Um, I mean, when you think about Scotty's book, I chopped 30,000 words, and I told him I was going to do it. It actually wasn't bad. It was just too much for what we wanted. If he had come up with uh, an, a really flawed product, I would have had the guts to tell him. I really would, because you have to do that to respect the people for whom you're working, the people who are paying your fee, and to think about his name and uh, his reputation as well. You're there to advise on that. I'd certainly, certainly do that every time and suggest a rewrite. I, well, look, in a way that terrible anthology that I edited a few years ago, I had to do that with a couple of instances. Two of the 16 contributors were just so bad, I had to send it back and suggest redoing the whole thing. It was just a disaster. Doctor. <laughs> Thanks. Um, would you like to say something, Nigel, about the, the part the editor might play in the ethics of what is happening? I'm thinking particularly about writing about family members yeah. um, who might be alive or uh, ex dead. Excellent question. OK. One of the toughest books, well, I think the hardest book I wrote and the one that gave me, gave me the greatest satisfaction... <sighs> this is really pretty close stuff was a man who, well, it may not, may not, may not, the name may not mean a lot here. It was a man who was a prominent author in Australia and Britain and the States to some extent back in the 50s and 60s. His name was Russell Braddon. He wrote possibly the finest war memoir ever called The Naked Island about his time as a prisoner on the Burma Railway and in Changi. He was a great writer. He wrote about 26 novels, maybe no, 15, 16 novels and 10, 11 works of non-fiction. Highly popular broadcaster, particularly in Britain. He presented on Australian television the bicentennial series Images of Australia. Very successful man in his day. I, I wrote his biography because he fascinated me. Also, he burnt all his papers, destroyed the lot, okay? <laughs> Which a number of people have done over the years. Um, uh, the, the works of Wilfred Owen, the favourite war poet, his brother destroyed most of his diaries and his correspondence. Um, one of the reasons for this was Braddon had a highly colourful sex life and a lot of it was pretty rough stuff. I was able to find this out later because I traced by the most incredible bit of sleuthing, I found his business manager who was living in a obscure part of Britain in some degree of poverty, and he had actually secreted lots of Braddon's papers and records and kept them, and he had them in his possession. I went to see him and I got the whole stuff from him. Um, stuff that Braddon hadn't burned. Uh, so when Braddon's sex life started coming out in this very strongly, I didn't want to appear to be lecturing, to be critical, to sitting in judgment. I watered it down a fair bit. There was an ethical question. I thought I was probably intruding too much. I didn't want to be judgmental. I 
try to let the reader work it out for themselves. I didn't need, so the need to be, see the need to be highly explicit. I thought it was a bit tasteless, and I took an ethical stance on that. So an editor, I think, should do the same sort of thing and say, this is actually going a bit far. You're going too much into the soul of this person. Um, I think you've got to be... There's a wonderful saying, the, the man, I, don't, I forget who it was, he was the biographer of the, the uh, New Zealand writer Janet Frame. She'd had a lot of mental anguish in her life. And he said, when I write her book, I'm going to tell the compassionate truth. Which I think is pretty good. It's a lovely expression. I think a degree of kindness is required. It's not being a censor. I think it's being tasteful and decent and ethical, and it comes into it very, very strongly. The stuff I could have said about Braddon wouldn't have been defamatory because it was true. But I thought, just going too far. The man's dead, not here to defend himself. Boom, boom, boom. I'll let the reader sort it out by suggestion rather than being explicit. And it comes in very, very strongly, the ethical side of things. Great question. Thank you. The compassionate truth. Worth remembering. Were there any other questions? Hello. And, uh, um, that's a good question. Okay. The, an editor is also a manuscript appraiser. Certainly can be. I, I, um, you, you can certainly be asked to do that. I think it's really important. You're, you are sitting in judgment as an informed assessor, an informed appraiser on the basis of your experience. I think you certainly are. Uh, that's, that's, that is not proofreading. That is really taking the thematic look at things, as I say. It's the bigger picture of editing, and uh, it, it's a critical matter. Um, I think it's a very good way of putting it. I, I like that. Well done. There certainly can be. Yes. Mm. Yes, I mean, you have to say, even the great Somerset Maugham allowed this American pr professor to do that degree of mentoring, even when he was highly successful and published works that are sold in their millions. Sir? You made a comment about um, it's important to get books reviewed. Yeah. Uh, I've been sort of fairly close to two, written by two different authors, who both got great reviews, yeah. uh, but didn't sell. So yeah, sure. is there something one can say, are reviews always <laughs> <laughs> bright? <laughs> I suggest they're probably not read by a huge number of people, um, but... If you are a writer, you've got to have your work reviewed. You've just got to. I mean, we, we, we need to know. I, I, I take that sort of valuation terribly seriously, and there's no point ever in attacking a reviewer, however unfair you think it might be. Uh, and you can usually tell if the reviewer has actually read the book or not. Uh, I think it, 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 it's a good thing to do. You, you've... At least you're being recognised. Even if they say, you know, David Harris's work is rubbish, someone's read it, you think. It's, 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 it's a form, another form of appraisal that's out there and people have taken the trouble, we think, to read your work and offer an opinion. I find it vital and if I'm not reviewed, I feel terribly left out and unwanted and a bit sad. <laughs> on that same vein, you had some comments on, the, on four words the other day as well. Forward. Oh, yes. But may I just take that question? Yes. Mm, thank you. Just uh, in reference to the reviews, uh, mm. I found that actually bad reviews help legitimise your good ones. If you've got all good reviews, yeah, people yeah, yeah. get really suspicious. That's good. <laughs> well done. A great reply. I remember that. Thank you. Uh, and Sarah just asked me about the forward, which um, wonderful F-O-R-E, W-O-R-D, the forward to a book. Um, I think it's a really nice thing to do. If you can write, get someone to write a forward to your book, terrific feeling. Now, my, my uh, biography of Russell Braddon, I got Dame J Joan Sutherland to write the forward. He had written her biography back in the 1960s, and it sold incredibly well. And although it's rather hagiographic in form, it has some wonderful passages about her conquering of the four great opera houses of the world for the first time in the late 50s, early 60s. So I wrote to her and she most graciously wrote back and said, I'd love to do a forward for your book, which she did, which was really nice. So I was able to splash that on the cover. Um, 
this book, which I might not have mentioned, is available for twenty dollars tonight. It's, um, <laughs> um, signed. <laughs> signed. Has a foreword by Joanna Trollope. Anyone here? Show of hands. Anyone know Joanna Trollope? Yes. Yes, her books, yeah, her books. Okay, good. She is a highly popular British author. She writes what they call over there the Aga Saga, sort of middle-class stuff set around the family kitchen range, but it's great stuff. Her book, her novel, The Soldier's Wife, I highly commend to you. It's about an Afghanistan veteran, comes back, cannot settle in with his family. They're terrified of him. Now, she clearly did a lot of research of that. It's a great book. Joanna, okay. Now, she is a distant relative of the great... Victorian author, Anthony Trollope. I just looked up, up her address in Who's Who, dropped her a letter. She was, oh, I'd love to do a forward for your book. So it, especially with British sales, that really helped. It shows you've got that imprimatur from someone who's a figure of importance. And having a forward for a book is really important. Um, there we are. Scotty Bucock, forward by Ray Martin. The uh, former daytime TV host and journalist, that sort of thing. He was a great pal of Scotty's. And that is the right sort of person for that book. Now, if we had forward by the Archbishop of Canterbury, probably wouldn't be right. But, but Ray Martin, the Scotty, works perfectly. And he, he, loved, he said, oh, yeah, I'd love to do it. So it was fine. It is important. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to meet Scott, he's very enthusiastic, as you mentioned before. Mm. And he came up with the 50-odd 50, 50 thousand words, even though he... Knew there was a limit, but I'm, I'm actually really excited to read this book because to see how you've managed to pull that together mm. into a... The biggest challenge was getting away from the chronological rendition. Mm -hmm. That was the big challenge. And then to link... The, you've got to have a segue, you know, a passage in time. You've got to have a reason for saying, now we're going ahead 20 years, now we're going to go back, go back 15, without confusing the reader. It's really important. These leaps in time are not necessarily easy. Well, I did the Russ Braddon biography. Instead of saying, Russ Braddon was born on the 15th of February, 1921, that sort of thing, I started out with the first time he killed a man in combat. That gave it a real lead. How did this happen? How was this young man here from a wealthy Sydney family, how was he suddenly hand-to-hand -hand combat in the jungle, the bayonet? We go back and we find out how and why. And you've got to have these movements in time, and a good editor will help you with that keep the drama going. Because with Scots, you mentioned one particular part of the story you cut right back and mm. then another was just a small line and you asked him to exactly. expand on that. He, uh, he, he was talking, uh, for example, um, on, on one occasion about... I did have a bit of sex on the mind tonight, but uh, he, said, <laughs> he said the first time he went to America, he got a, he, he, he got a job um, working in a bar or something like that. And he said, also, I... I, I um, the only place I could find to live was with a drag queen. He went on, with a drag queen? This is young Scotty, the boy from Alice. What an incredible existence. So I said, please develop this, develop it. And it turned out this wonderful this performer, this guy, would, uh, had Scotty in his house, the young Aussie boy, and uh, he would get Scott to model his wigs for him and his gear and all that sort of stuff. And it really added another dimension to the story. Mm. It, it was worth developing that line uh, to, to just give a bit of entertainment, yeah, that passage yeah. of his life. Thanks for reminding That's me of that. That's OK. <laughs> You're a great interviewer. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hello. They might have me back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you've done it before. <laughs> Hello. Have you ever been advised to audition? Ah, OK, yes. Um, I, again, I've done that extensively through literary societies for my latest book. Um, I... I found it very useful to have it done for you by those organisations if they will take it on for you and promote the book and uh, help with sales and talk about forthcoming launches and speeches and that sort of thing. found that really useful. Great question. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Just in the interest of keeping to our timeline, mm. to give everyone a chance to, to mingle and ask each other questions because everyone has different experiences. Um, Nigel, did you have any extra things that you would like to leave us with? OK, uh, I, just, I just want to say how encouraged I am not only to see you, see you but by books. Um, I thought they were dying for a while, and they're not. And book sales are actually rising. I think that's wonderful. So the, the perceptiveness of the questions and the, 
the bright eyes around the room and this, this love of language is enormously rewarding. And uh, I just believe that with this sort of strength out there, we're just going to go on and on. I mean, the huge number of books, it's going to get bigger and bigger. It's just a beautiful thing. I, lo I love wallowing books and rolling around in newspapers. I just adore it so much. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't picture that. <laughs> <laughs> So if there aren't any other official questions with yeah. the microphone, and, and Nigel's going to be um, hanging around and spending time yeah. with us for the, for the next hour or so while yeah, we have sure. supper. And, and please don't be afraid to ask any of the staff who have the blue name tags if you've got a specific question. If they can't answer it, they'll put you in touch with someone who can. Uh, and we will move these chairs shortly so you can have a look at the bookshelf and, and see if there's anything that any... Um, questions that you have about book construction or print. Yeah, sure. We also have tours available for people. So if you want to have a look at the production process, let, let one of the staff know and we'll take small tours around and, and explain how the printing process works. Uh, we also have Nigel's book for sale tonight for $20. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's signed. <laughs> if you're interested in registering for um, to be notified when Scott's book is launched, which is... Probably. Oh, wow. Roughly. Mm. Three, three weeks. Three weeks. Oh. Wow. Three weeks away. Right. Um, we have a registration sheet and uh, maybe four weeks, depending on how quick Nigel uh, is. Uh, the, uh, yeah, and the man <laughs> himself, he's a dynamo, he's an incredible man. So, so we'll, you can add your email address. No obligation to buy, but at least you know then when it comes out and you, you have the choice. Um, we would like to thank Nigel, of course, for being here this evening. So please oh, put your you. hands together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now have supper, so please stay and and join in. There are um, there's red and white wine. There are soft drinks, tea and coffee, and uh, and some nibbles for everyone to enjoy. So please make your way out before you do leave tonight. Though there are surveys on everybody's chair, and we would love your feedback. Again, we don't know what we should next talk about if we don't know what, what you need to know and what you're interested in. So please fill those surveys in. There's also some information on the chair if you haven't already received it about uh, the things that we can help you with for self, with regards to self-publishing and a copy of our journal. I think that may be it. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Thank you.